What's up, everyone? Welcome back to Dr. Lee Unhinged. I'm Dr. Maxfield. And I'm Dr. Shaw. And in this episode, we are going to be talking about first some life updates. I got a really exciting announcement uh, that I'll be talking about on this episode. Then we're going to talk about some of the hacks that you've seen online. You've seen some dermatologists talk about it. You've seen some skincare influencers talk about them. We're going to talk about the common hacks that we're seeing right now going viral right now, what we tried, liked, and what we tried and disliked. And we're also going to be having chat GPT build us a skincare routine. And that's pretty much it. Yeah, that's a lot. I'm actually very excited for this episode. This is uh, some extremely fun stuff, but actually the biggest part of this is going to be the first part. So life updates, Dr. Shaw has a lot to share. I want to hear it. All right. So I won't go into long because there's a lot of other things that happened. Uh, I went to New York uh, to perform a hair <laughs> transplant on my brother. I could go into that in heavy detail, but I won't for now. Uh, for now, what I will say is that I am launching a brand and the brand is called Remedy Science, also known as Remedy. There it is. This is huge. Massive news. Um, I've been working on it behind the scenes. You've actually seen, if you've been following on other platforms, you've seen polls that I've been dropping into the audience, questions on packaging, uh, questions on skincare concerns that I've been gathering over the past few years. Um, but I've been working on the brand for over two and a half years. We spent that time pretty much focusing on research and development, trying to make the best products possible. So I'm super excited about the products that we created. They're not ready yet for all of you to purchase. So you're so that's a little bit of a letdown, I know. Uh, but I'm just announcing that the brand is coming in March. So uh, when you when you listen to this, just be on the lookout. You can go to remedyskin.com um, to join our uh, uh, email signup list. You'll be the first to know when the products are actually getting released. But we're launching the brand in March. But in the meantime, we have a limited edition merch drop for all of you to participate in which is my headbands so uh, these silk 100 percent silk headbands that i'm always wearing in all my skincare videos we made them uh, for all of you so limited available on instagram shop and tiktok shop so definitely check those out they're super high quality and they got the embroidered remedy logo so you now know what it looks like yeah, I had the chance to wear one and I was re-watching the video we shot with that. I was like, okay, this actually looks really good. And then I was kind of pissed because I realized you didn't leave one for me. And, uh, <laughs> I was like, what the? This is some crap. Yeah, actually, like, <laughs> strategically, that was a bad move for me not to leave it with you because when we officially launch them now, uh, you won't have them to tell people about. So that was that was probably pretty poor planning on my part. I'll have to have one shipped from our warehouse to you. <laughs> that would be great. I'll actually use it. <laughs> No, but uh, but I've been wearing them in videos. People always ask me about them. So now they're available. Definitely go check them out and then uh, go to remedyskin.com and sign up um, for our wait list. So uh, super excited. You guys gave me the opportunity to be able to do this um, without all of you um, listening to what we ramble on about. Uh, I would not have the platform or the resources to be able to launch what we created. And I really, truly believe Remedy will significantly change the skincare industry with the formulas that we're putting out. So I'm super excited about it. It kind of fits in line with everything that we've talked about already. So I don't think it'll be like a surprise what products I'm coming out with, but, <laughs> uh, but, but in the comments, you can try to guess um, what you think we're going to be coming out with. So that's the major life update. And then we'll move into hacks that we tried and liked and hacks that we tried and disliked. What's your first one, Dr. Maxfield? My first one I'll go with is the, uh, the double cleanse, I guess. The mm. this is uh, so double cleansing. Just basically, is you use an oil based cleanser and then a water based cleanser after this, and it's gotten more traction again lately. I know I've noticed even though that skincare. What did you just drink? For those of you who don't know, Doctor Shaw just drank something and did uh, not enjoy it. It's a ginger and uh, turmeric um, shot, like a wellness shot. Nice. Yeah, you don't look well. That didn't sit well. The uh, <laughs> The double cleanse anyway, oil-based cleanser, traditional cleanser, helps remove water-resistant sunscreen and makeup. We recently did the uh, full video on this, so everyone probably who's listening to us is well aware of this. This is something that's cycled back. It's become very popular again, especially with some uh, like the Anua oil-based cleanser becoming very popular along with it. The reason I like this is I think more people benefit from this than they would realize. Not only is it for the everyday makeup wearer, it's also for the active individual who uses sunscreen like on a regular basis, like your surfer, your runner, your athletes, like those people 
probably should know more about this. They may not be completely in tune with the skincare world, but I think this is a hack that would actually serve them well. It makes removing your makeup and your sunscreen extremely, extremely easy. The only people who need to probably be a little cautious about this are those with like dry sensitive skin and also not for everyone. So you don't have to double cleanse if you're not one of those individuals that we talked about with the makeup sunscreen. Yeah, only when I wear heavy sunscreen do I do I double cleanse. Most of the time I just use a single cleanser. All right, name name one of your favorite, just one, a favorite favorite double cleansing products right now. It's still the Versed non-cleansing balm because they have two products. The one I actually like for their cleansing for the cleansing balm is their non-cleansing balm, the Sweet Relief Overnight Barrier Balm. For those of you on camera, it's in this green little tub. That's the first and then I'll follow that up with something traditional like the uh, La Roche-Posay Purifying Foaming Facial Cleanser um, to Larian sub brand. And uh, that's like <laughs> a super robust cleanse, super robust cleanse. The same thing, though. It's not like an everyday thing, but it's for that like thick sunscreen day. Um, so you can mix and match this into your life. Well, that's a good hack. Double cleansing. Been around for a long time now. Um, I think pretty much endorsed by most at this point, um, especially in those conditions. So let's talk about the next hack uh, that we've been seeing going viral. And this is using hyaluronic acid on the lips. So your traditional hyaluronic acid face serum, you're going to put it on the lips to plump the lips. Now, according to the rumors online, if you use this a few times a day, uh, you will notice a noticeable plumping in your lips. So what are your thoughts about this hack? Have you tried it? And I'll tell you my experience. Um, so uh, I have not tried it. I'll talk more about how I like to layer hydration on the lips. But hyaluronic acid is a solo ingredient in theory. So hyaluronic acid is a good humectant. It draws water from the surrounding environment and from the skin itself to plump. So that functional part, sure, that's fine. That's actually probably legitimate. However, it increases on its own transepidermal water loss and most humectants will. So you could in fact have like the driest, plumpest, shriveled raisins of lips. If you can imagine a world where that exists, um, if you use this ingredient on its own, and that's always one of the major knocks on humectants and hyaluronic acid, it can leave you feeling drier. Right. So that, that that's probably my main issue with this hack is, hey, you know, your lips are a little not plump. Uh, let's throw on some hyaluronic acid and you're going to be good to go. Um, and, uh, you know, I just factually think that that's not true. And that's from my own experience of trying this hack myself. First of all, hyaluronic acid products by themselves, like, like let's say, for example, my one of my favorite hyaluronic acid products is mm. the Vichy Mineral 89. Tastes terrible, actually. It's extremely <laughs> bitter. Um, okay. And I, so, if, you know, I'm not making this up. You could try it and taste it yourself. Gotta try um, it. But it's not a good tasting product. So, first of all, not a good experience to just raw dog it on your lips. So, I didn't enjoy that. The second piece of that is that I didn't notice like the, the plumping effect of it was 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 minimal, but, you know, maybe, maybe noticeable, minim minimally, minimally noticeable improvement in plumping of the lips. I will give you that. However, my lips after a few minutes started to feel either more dry or back to baseline. So I, I agree, like especially the lips, especially the lips compared to the rest of the face because the lips either have no stratum corneum layer of the skin or a very slim, thin stratum corneum layer of the skin, you are more likely with hyaluronic acid to lose water through your lips than you would in other parts of the face. And so that transepidermal water loss is going to be increased with just using hyaluronic acid alone. So I do not recommend, especially if you have dry lips, especially if you live in an arid climate, for you to just raw dog hyaluronic acid on your lips by itself. But if you want to lip slug, I would endorse that. So let's talk about that hack instead. So yeah, he set me up there because uh, on my short list is lip slugging. So slugging is a concept that is not at all violent, contrary to what I first assumed. But it's the idea of layering moisture with an occlusive end step. So traditionally on the skin, you know, you put down your like normal moisturizer, you could even do hyaluronic acid serum, then moisturizing cream, then an occlusive ointment like petrolatum. Now, I, I think this is great for sensitive skin. I actually like it even better for lips because with really dry lips, even though I love petrolatum or Vaseline for it, I find that because it doesn't bring much moisture to the lips, like if my lips are extremely dry already, I feel like it doesn't add a whole lot of value. However, if I layer a moisturizer on my lips, 
and then add the petrolatum ointment. I actually think that hydrates it and then locks it in and it feels a whole lot better. Subjectively, I like that combination. And so, yes, three steps it, sure, hyaluronic acid, cream, petrolatum, or even conversely, hyaluronic acid and then an occlusive. But that's why you see hyaluronic acid married with other ingredients in skincare. Like you'll always, almost, almost always have hyaluronic acid with something else. Even in your HA products, it's usually with something else. Yeah, uh, I completely agree with that. And I don't think you need a three-step skincare routine for your lips, to be clear. <laughs> We're big proponents of simple skincare. So um, you could, you know, layer multiple moisturizers. Um, but I do like this idea of taking your traditional gentle moisturizer and then layering like a Vaseline on top of it to really lock in the moisture. Um, if you would be interested in a very hydrating lip product, <laughs> going to remedyskin.com would not be a bad option in the next few months. Um, <laughs> no reason, no reason. No reason at all. Just check it out. Uh, but no, no, but I completely agree with you. I think that that hack is much preferred. So if you're going to put hyaluronic acid on your lips for that, that, that mild plumping effect, then I would actually layer uh, Vaseline over it just to lock in that hydration. And then um, another option for plumping the lips, if you didn't want to go the hyaluronic acid route because you did find it more drying, then I would go with a peptide. Um, like I think it's like palmitol tripeptide one or something like that, that is in uh, all the lip plumping products. Um, mm -hmm. Yep, that is correct. Palmitol tripeptide one, palmitol tripeptide 38. Those are often used in combination. Mm -hmm. The inky list has that controversial plumping lip balm that sits with those. Um, but I much prefer that to anything else for like menthol camp for, which are more trashy and worser. I'm just trying to make up the worstest words for them, uh, in your lip balm. I really hate to see those in a lip balm, even more than skincare. Like I hate the menthol camp for lip balms. Those are certainly a worse option than hyaluronic acid for plumping lips. Absolutely agree with that as well. All right. So what other hack do you like, dislike that you've seen online lately? Uh, do, 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 do. the like, the like, I like the, uh, dandruff shampoo for the face wash. That one is, it seems more like a real true home hack than some of the rest of these. Um, it almost might seem like a misuse of product, but it really is okay in that functionally, uh, these anti-dandruff products kill yeast, right? So how that relates to our scalp is seborrheic dermatitis or dandruff is caused by a yeast consuming our oils. Now, the thing that many people don't know about and certainly didn't know before social media was this yeast also lives on our face and causes multiple conditions, including seborrheic dermatitis on the face, red flaky skin on the eyebrows around the nose in the beard area, or even certainly contributes to pitterosporum folliculitis or fungal acne, which is still a lot less common than people think. And it can be helpful for the seborrheic dermatitis dandruff part. Absolutely. And it may be helpful for the fungal acne portion, I think better for prevention than treatment. Um, and then also, I guess, tinea versicolor, but it's not that common that that lives on the face. That's more of like your body problem. Right. So using a dandruff shampoo on the face, does it have benefits? I think for the right person, it certainly has the right benefits. And I would almost use it more like a mask, you know, where you keep it on for two to three minutes, you wash it off, you kind of let it set in because you really want those antifungal ingredients to kick in. And there's specifically two ingredients that you would look for for those antifungal properties. So, uh, sorry, three. Uh, ketoconazole, selenium sulfide, and zinc pyrithian. You would not want to use the sal acid one for, for um, specifically the yeasty stuff on the skin because it's more for the flaking than it is for the yeast. Now, you want to use your salicylic acid shampoo on the face for acne. I mean, just use a salicylic acid cleanser that's more formulated in facial care. Now, I would the surfactants that you find in cleansers for the hair tend to be a little bit harsher than the ones that you find for the face. So yeah. you could find that your dandruff shampoo is pretty irritating to you um, when you put it on the face like that. But this hack is incredibly effective for people with that dandruff or seborrheic dermatitis on the face and for people with fungal acne, also known as malassezia or pitorosporum folliculitis. And so definitely if you have those two conditions, I think it can certainly be beneficial. Um, it's something that I do every now and again, because uh, I do suffer from dandruff every now and then. So I think it's a, a good hack if used on the right person. I think probably most people overuse this hack when they run into it. So if you have a good purpose for doing it, I would recommend it. Yeah. And that's, well, that's the key of like the diagnostic portion, like how well do you know your skin? And that's where the value of seeing a professional comes in because, yeah, this can be helpful. Probably not going to be helpful for the majority of people, but it could be you 
but you need to confirm that before you commit to this, uh, especially long-term. All right, perfect. So the next hack that I have is sleep pillows. You have seen a sleep pillow on your feet at some point. Yeah. It's a pillow that is meant to reduce wrinkles. And they're all over your feeds and they're all over my inbox as well. <laughs> I have received in the course of my social media career, I would call it, I have received over a thousand emails from the facial pillow companies. They are all over it. They really want us to talk about the pillows. What are your thoughts? on facial pillows to reduce wrinkles. Okay, so I did deep dive this too. Actually, every time we talk about things, I'm like, I deep dive this, and I did. So there are some studies on facial wrinkles and sleep. Now, interestingly, no matter which side you slept on, whether you slept on your left side or your right side, you had more wrinkles on your left side. And the thought is, is that the wrinkles and sagging that were studied in this study were not related to your sleep positioning because one, it's mostly from sun damage. Like sun damage far outweighs the sleep habits in terms of facial aging, including wrinkles and sagging. And then the and then with that along, like we get more sun damage on the left side, primarily because of driving. And then the second reason is that we move in our sleep. Like uh, I move probably 500 times a night. I think one study said the average person switches positions at least 20 times a night, sometimes up to 50 times a night. And so we actually are somewhat dynamic while we sleep. Even if your face is paralyzed and you don't move, you've covered it in frownies, you're still going to reposition your whole body, your face included, while you sleep. So it's not like it's truly static and all of the gravity is not truly compressing that one side of your face while you sleep, contributing to wrinkles on that single side. Is it something that you should be concerned about? Probably as concerned as you should be as about, you know using a straw to prevent wrinkles around yeah. the mouth. A um, a, a pretty low risk, I would argue. Um, and yeah, you do like, you know, you fall asleep and you wake up like if you sleep in a weird position, you wake up with like a weird line on your face, right? Like yeah, this morning I rolled out of bed, go to the personal trainer, woke up with a giant line on my face, you know, I hate when that happens. But but yes, the compression from your face against the pillow is certainly going to cause distortion of the face and could potentially cause a wrinkle. However, there's no evidence that a pillow is going to prevent this from happening, right? One, is the concern high enough? I would say it's not high enough for me to change my pillow. Two, um, there's no evidence that changing your pillow would actually have any profound impact on this. And the third piece of this is, are these pillows even comfortable? And my argument would be no. And if you're going to get lower quality sleep, <laughs> then it's worse probably for aging than uh, than, ha than the, the shape of your pillow. Okay. So yeah, the uh, the pillows. Um, this interestingly became my wife's favorite pillow. I agree with Dr. Shaw. I did not have a positive experience with this for some reason. And then, you know, it's just purely subjective. That's just an N of one. Totally was my wife's favorite pillow. She brought it along with us for trips. She actually lost it when we were on vacation because she was important enough to bring with her. We have not replaced it. That is a very subjective experience, but also I'd say not comfortable. However, there is a pillow you should be buying. And this, let me show you who. Let me tell you for who and what it looks like rather. This is a donut pillow. This is similar to the donut pillow you will sit on if you have hemorrhoids. So is this the hemorrhoid pillow for your face? Yes. Who should be using it? It's for a specific condition called chondrodermatitis nodularis helices. It is when your ear gets inflamed and irritated. And it's actually pretty common, usually in older individuals, but it, I see it multiple, multiple times a week. The cartilage along your ear gets red, inflamed. Sometimes people are concerned it's a skin cancer. But the number one treatment for that is actually foundationally relieving pressure. So a donut pillow for your ear is reasonable. They do make donut pillows for your face for wrinkles too. I have seen those. Um, but that is who should buy a special pillow and specifically what condition for. Completely agree. I see this super often. And a lot of times you're like, is this a skin cancer? Is this an actinic keratosis, which is a precancer? Or is this an actual pressure lesion on the, on the ear? And more often than not, it is that pressure mm -hmm. lesion on the ear. And so very, very common. And switching the pillow does make a big difference. And so there definitely is a ton of utility there. The other argument I would make for a, an, uh, an, an unusually shaped pillow would be potentially after like a surgery or after filler, um, you didn't want to put pressure on a certain area. I could see that be beneficial. 
um, beyond that, I would say just find a pillow that you're going to get the best sleep with and uh, try to optimize other parts of your skincare routine. If you like the comfort of the pillow, then I, I don't think it could be harmful in any way to to use one. So um, not big on the pillows. We tried them. Both of us tried them. Um, we have politely declined um, opportunities with the pillow brands out there. Um, but uh, feel free to send us more pillows. I mean, I'm willing to try any pillow. Um, but, uh, but in the meantime, we will politely decline. Thank you so much for reaching out over the last three years, every day for three years. <laughs> <laughs> On that note though, I do not want, you know, those giant square pillows, like they're huge cube pillows. Uh -huh. I can't imagine that being comfortable. But the other thing I do want to try, and uh, I know one of our colleagues, Dr. Cassell has this, it's the temperature controlled air mattress. Boy, I would love that. Like the mattress that's like 55 degrees. Woo. I feel like I'd sleep so well. I completely agree with that. We do know that temperature affects your sleep. And so kind of being in that 68, 67 range um, is actually better for your sleep. And um, there are like cooling mechanisms, especially it could be on one side of the bed. So if you have somebody who's a hot sleeper or someone's a cold sleeper, you could actually mm -hmm. just put this cooling on one side of the bed. So I actually think that's something that has a, a lot of utility and people would probably benefit a lot from that, from just getting better sleep in general. Cause I know, I mean, a lot of people are tracked to sleep now. They have the whoop bands, they have the aura rings and you know, the quality of your sleep definitely affects your next day. Um, and so I think, uh, I think improving the quality of your sleep can make a big difference. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now to misuse of ingredients, like here's some other trending topics that I know we've talked about at length. Um, and I'll open the discussion to this and I'll hear your thoughts on it. Um, I almost kind of combine these two, but and I've, maybe we should talk about both or one you pick, but the rosemary oil hack for hair and then spearmint tea uh, for acne. Where do you live with those? Or one, just pick whichever one you engage with or resonate with more or less. You know, rosemary oil has the one study that compares it to 2% minoxidil and it says that they're sort of equivalent with less side effects and less side effects on the rosemary oil side. And so a lot of people ran with this and they said, well, you know, it's as good as Rogaine um, at least. So let's start using it. Um, and, you know, I think it's tough. It's one study. Is it harmful? Um, I think not. And I actually would recommend to people that like, hey, if you want to take a quote unquote more natural route um, to your hair loss, I, you know, it's something that I would recommend to people. However, um, I do think that minoxidil has shown consistently better results. I think oral medications like finasteride for men, spironolactone for women, um, have shown more consistent results with hair growth than any of those things have. And so, um, what I tell people with hair specifically, and, um, I'm, I'm going to start doing a lot more hair growth content because people are actually asking a lot more questions about it. But, uh, what I tell people with hair specifically is that it's like a, it's like a garden. It's like a plant, like, and it makes sense because your hair can look like a garden in some situations. Um, and you need many things for your plants to grow. So it's, you need water and you need sunlight. Um, and then you need soil and then you need nutrients in the soil. And then maybe you want some fertilizer in there. Right. And then there are people who like pray to the plants, right. And they pet their plants. And there are people that, you know, there are people that really kind of nurture these plants in different ways. Really? No, seriously. There are people who like, like you give TLC to their, to their plants. This is real. This is real. Um, okay. Okay. So I'm, I'm kind of like, I'm, I'm kind of painting a story here, right? There's a lot of things you can do to make your garden grow. Now, when it comes to making your garden grow, um, there are certain things that are critical, water and sunlight, right? And so let's say that minoxidil, finasteride, and these things that are proven to help with hair growth are those things, right? Now, the other things, right? Like the fertilizer, like maybe that's PRP. Like, do you need fertilizer? And is fertilizer going to make a huge difference? It could definitely help, but it's not like a guaranteed going to help, but could boost, right? So that's like your PRP. Then you have things like rosemary oil, where it's more like, um, you know, having the right soil, um, setting like you know you, you have soil but this soil is a little bit more nutrient rich soil or something like this right so it's so it's 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 incremental improvement towards a healthier plant but it's not the foundation of what you need to grow your hair and so i actually i think people should do more right if they want the perfect plant um but i don't think it's foundational to a hair loss routine yeah this is actually subtly becoming the theme of our year i don't know if you've noticed um but we keep harping on the same idea of like foundational versus supportive care. And um, this is like, this is a very, this is like clearly 
a the heart of the Dr. Lee world right now, the Dr. Lee universe is like, for some reason, Dr. Sean and I are like, are very invested in pro, like making it very clear to you what is a foundational treatment and what is supporting. Because if you just go with the supporting, so here included, if you just go with your rosemary oil for hair growth, if you just go with your spironolactone for your acne and you forego the foundational uh, soil, uh, whatever your plant metaphor was, then you're not going to get good results. It's all going to fall apart. It's going to collapse upon itself and you have to build it the other way around. So yes, while it can be helpful, it is not something you should forego other treatments for. It's something you should add on to the better treatments if you're looking for a successful routine. Hair growth, skincare, whatever, same principle applies. Right. So I'm a fan of it um, in general, but I do it in addition to other things. Um, right now, I do my hair loss routine every night and it, it does not currently include rosemary oil. So, um, so yeah, so I would just say that, you know, it's not something that you need to get, uh, but I don't think it's harmful in any way and may actually have some benefit. So spearmint tea, I think uh, for acne and other things, um, much more complicated discussion about how spearmint interacts with the androgens and hormones in your body and whether or not that could help with hormonal acne or whether or not that could help with symptoms of PCOS. So we could probably address that in another video. But in the meantime, let's talk about Rogaine for eyebrow growth. And that's going to be the last hack that I'll talk about right now. But a lot of people talk about Rogaine for eyebrow growth and they talk about Rogaine for beard growth. Now there is one study that shows that Rogaine or minoxidil, topical minoxidil, can help with beard growth. It was done in a 3% lotion and they showed improvement. It makes sense. The mechanism by which Rogaine grows hair will help hair on any part of the body. Um, and so you will see benefits with this hack. Now, particularly for the eye, for the eyebrows, um, I, will, I will admit that you probably will see benefit by putting it there. Now, if you're somebody like me who's kind of sensitive to Rogaine or minoxidil, I hold or retain a lot of water when I take Rogaine, um, whether it's oral minoxidil or even topical minoxidil, I will retain water in my upper face, especially around my eyes. Now, so for somebody like me putting, putting uh, minoxidil or Rogaine on the eyebrows um, sounds terrifying to me. Um, one, probably because it would burn if it got in my eye, but two, because I think the puffiness around my eyes would get much worse. And it's something that already bothers me quite a bit. Interesting. Uh, I'll share some anecdote with you. So I do use topical and oral minoxidil in my practice. I have had patients come back with the oral minoxidil. And the reason they stopped it is they started growing hair, like fine hairs, especially around their cheeks or women on the sides of the face. And even their eyebrows, they complained that it was getting a little bit unkempt and wild. So this hack, sure. Um, it physiologically works better than something that targets hormones would like because we don't lose our eyebrows. It's not hormonally mediated in the same way that our scalp is hormonally mediated with hair loss. And again, minoxidil Rogaine does not work through mediating the hormonal component of hair loss. So it can be helpful. I think the hack is legitimate. I think you should be thoughtful when you do it and whether it's for you or not, that's up to you. But um, yeah, we'll, we'll have to, I feel like we should make a, I don't know, like an eyebrow video or something. Oh, we, we do. Could do your grooming habits that uh, there's a little bit to the story. There's a little bit to the story. <laughs> so um, now there's another thing you could do around the eye eyebrows um, that has been tested on the eye. So that kind of makes me feel a little bit more comfortable. And that would be to use topical latisse. So latisse is a prostaglandin and uh, as a prostaglandin, it can thicken the hair uh, follicle and it can also um, lengthen the hair and, you know, grow more hair essentially. So, um, so that could be beneficial around the eyebrows. Now we have to talk about the risks of this. So topical latisse has been, some people get some atrophy around the eyes and that's kind of like mixed, whether that's true or that's not, or that's accurate or it's not, but some people will notice some atrophy, um, some fat atrophy from this, uh, especially around the eyelids. And then the other thing that people experience is some inflammation because prostaglandin is inflammatory. Um, and so some people experience uh, like blepharitis around the eyelids from using Latisse on the eyelids. So, you know, using it around the eyebrows, you could have a similar effect. And then the last thing that people experience is actually dark, 
dark circles from using this product. And so we could talk more details about Latisse and go into it is quite effective. Like the results that you see in people who use this mm -hmm. on their eyelashes is actually really profound. Um, but some people do a, a small set of people experience kind of those three side effects. One, uh, dark circles from increased pigmentation two inflammation or blepharitis and three, some people get some fat atrophy around the eyes. Um, so when using it on the eyebrows, I actually think you would see a lot of good results with it, but you have to keep in mind those three side effects and whether or not you want to potentially interact with those. Those are some of the hacks. There's actually a lot more. Uh, we'll maybe go into those another time. Maybe we'll demonstrate them on a YouTube video. I think that'd be a lot of fun. But the uh, next part of this is uh, our editor shared with us an article from somewhere. <laughs> Allure. Allure. Okay. About yeah. chat GVT AI. Um, so I, I stand by my idea though that chat gbt is not profound it's not actually that wonderful it's not amazing it's not brilliant we did that video a while ago that podcast a while ago and i was like nah it's not going to be a thing it's just gimmicky kind of i stand by that i was like a year later i'm underwhelmed by chat gbt's uh acuity and if you've seen any videos of it playing chess it's pretty trash yeah no that's fair i mean but if you trained a uh a model on how to, it, it would be better than 99.9% .9 of people at chess, right? So, no, it's so well, bad. Not, not chat GPT, but like another model, right? Just like, AI in general? Oh, yeah. Well, no, mean, no, like what didn't Watson, didn't they train Watson on chess and it like beat most people? Oh, yeah. The AI overall is better than humans in chess, like infinitely so. But chat, not GPT, chat GPT specifically yeah, yeah. is um, like a, an infant playing chess or worse. It's pretty poor. Uh, well, because it's not, you know, it's a language model, not necessarily like, you know, artificial intelligence and like solving problems. But um, that being said, let's talk about it in the tones of it because, you know, you're getting a little, well, because I'm actually pretty high on the capabilities of ChatGPT. And like, that doesn't mean that I think it's like a good thing that like AI is coming, right? Like, it's just a fact that it's coming and like being aware that it's here and how it's going to potentially interact with like affect your future careers and jobs and how either either it's it's come it's coming right it's like let's say for example you're you know the the horse and buggy and the car just got released right like you could pontificate about how the cars are going to ruin the world and how it's going to lead to global warming and it's going to like uh cause all this kind of carbon pollution in the world you could make that argument but you're not going to stop the car from taking over the horse and buggy right in 1920 right so it's sort of the same thing. Like I do think that AI movement is here and it's like here to stay. And um, you could try to cling to, to the other things, but like you have to decide like how are you going to interact with it? Are you going to stay horse and buggy or are you going to figure out a way to make open AI and chat GPT and um, AI in general be part of your life in a meaningful way that's going to help you, right? Is it going to take notes from your meetings? Is it going to uh, summarize things like chat GPT just did right there? So that's, that's kind of high level. I don't, I, like, I, it's not like, it, for me, it's completely impartial. It's, it's like, it's here and like, it's getting more and more powerful in my opinion. And certainly it's not great at every task, but um, compared to like what it used to do, like if you could see some of these images that they're generating and the videos that they're generating, I mean. Oh, those are crazy. Yeah. I mean, it's incredible, like the advancements that have been made oh, yeah. in AI. And I only think, and now you see, you know, like the, uh, the guy from open AI, Sam Altman is trying to raise like a trillions of dollars for his next project. And so the more money you put behind these projects, the more likely they are to succeed. And so we're seeing investors really invest in AI, which means that it's probably going to start to have like a significant impact on our lives. And it's just something that we all need to be aware about. And think about how it's going to be interacting with our own personal lives. But let's talk about this chat GPT skincare routine. Cause what I typed in into chat GPT was I have combination skin with texture and wrinkles, build me a skincare routine for the morning and night. What'd it give you? Boom. It spit out a skincare routine. So it's a very long skincare routine. It's uh, seven steps in the morning, nine steps at night in the morning. They go cleanser, toner, vitamin C, hydrating serum, eye cream, moisturizer, sunscreen. Then at night they say oil cleanser, optional second cleanser exfoliation two to three times a week interesting toner retinol or retinoid treatment hydrating serum eye cream moisturizer and then optional treatments to target wrinkles and texture and otherwise what's very fascinating about this is that chat gpt is not pulling information from itself it's not generating information it's 
pulling from the internet. So this is kind of like what the internet thinks about these things, like a summary of what the internet thinks. And it's a very, very, very long routine. And then they actually gave me specific products for cleanser. They said CeraVe foaming cleanser or La Roche-Posay purifying foaming cleanser. Then they said toner from Thayer's. Then they said vitamin C from SkinCeuticals. Then they say hydrating serum from either the ordinary or Neutrogena. Then they say eye cream from Cetaphil or Rocks Retinol Correction Eye Cream. And then moisturizer, either Elta MD or the CeraVe AM moisturizer. These are products that you and I actually recommend yeah. quite a bit, minus a handful of these that we don't recommend. Um, and then at night, it's like the same thing. They go DHC deep cleansing oil. Two, CeraVe Hydrating Facial Cleanser, Exfoliate with Paula's Choice, Toner with Cosrx, Retinol from Rock or Paula's Choice, Hydrating Serum from Drunk Elephant, Eye Cream from Olay, Moisturizer, CeraVe PM. Literally, this is the routine they gave me. It's way too long, but it's sort of interesting to product selection. It is. You know what's interesting for me too, though? So I similarly, I, I did left it more open-ended. I just wanted to see what it came up with. I said, build me a skincare routine, period. And it, it did give me the caveat, basically, like tailor it towards your specific skin. And then it gave me a very similar one, like the five steps in the morning, eight steps at night. It's good. But uh, same thing. It's like Cetaphil Daily Facial Cleanser or CeraVe Hydrating Facial Cleanser. Same Thayer, Alcohols Free Witch Hazel Toner, um, serums like hyaluronic Acid, B, Vitamin C. It didn't give me a brand for the Vitamin C, though. And then CeraVe AM Facial Moisturizing Lotion or Hydro Boost Water Gel. Anyway, it goes on and on. And what I think is interesting is the products, like you mentioned, are actually somewhat tailored. They, they're, they are similar to what I would say to use or recommend. Conversely, if you look at the article about uh, what products were recommended, for some reason, it's like very, very different. And I kind of wonder what they typed into it. But they've got... They have an $88 morning cleanser, the Tata Harper Refreshing Cleanser. They have a $38 CoQ10 toner. They have a $78 vitamin C from Drunk Elephant, which means vitamin C. Then they have a $300 uh, Augustinus Bader, the Rich Cream, and then they have a $44 sunscreen. Um, and then at night, it's not much better. A $370 Dr. Barbara Sturm, which amazes me how expensive that is. Um, and then the $75 moisturizer, $50 mask i guess it depends on what they put into the prompt so yeah. if alert typed in make me the most expensive skincare routine and i don't want to see any benefits from it then <laughs> this would be the i'm kidding i'm kidding um you know it, i've tried the rich cream it's nice but you know 300 dollars, i'd rather buy other things but um it, it um it, it is interesting and I, I don't know like why the why the results are different and they vary from thing to thing but you know, it's it, it's surface level, like enough that you would see it in like a bad article, right? Like, you know, like we see all these like press articles online and like, you know, there's a lot of times it's like you kind of read through it and there's not like really much substance to it. Um, I would I would argue that like the quality of that output is probably equivalent um, to like a less researched, um, you know, article about like here's your morning skincare routine from the summer, right? Like I, if you see a headline for an article in a trade magazine and it says like um, a dermatologist recommended morning uh, skincare routine, you would see sometimes like a pro like an output like that. Like, so I, you know, I think it's, it's not good. It's not something that like you and I would recommend, um, but it is like enough that it would like pass the threshold to be published in my mind. But do you think it do you think it's pulling from our browser history or like, you know, our phones, everything listens to us. Like I am 100 percent certain of that. I've had it happen. I, I wonder because, you know, chat GBT pulls off of like just the Internet browser consolidates it like that's the value you told me it brings to the table is it synthesizing this information. Right. I wonder if it's personal enough to be pulling from our browser history and like our product information and like what we normally talk and search for. And if so, it, I, it's. That's a little impressive. And also, like, I, I'm not sure if I think it's positive or negative yet in terms of like telescoping ideas and things like that. Um, but that's that's interesting to me. Yeah, I mean, I think this uh, no idea is an original idea. I mean, it's only going to get worse now, right? Like, if oh, yeah. you have the ability, because right now it's very difficult, right? Like, let's say that there's a hundred articles, a thousand, a million articles, probably, let's say, written on hyaluronic acid in the world, right? 
But if um, ChatGPT is able to synthesize a million articles and come up with like sort of like what is all out there, I mean, it's like you're really kind of pulling mm -hmm. from like, you know, the deepest and darkest parts of the web to come up with these answers. And so I don't know how we utilize this tool ultimately like in our lives, you and I, but um, but I, I do think it's interesting based on the output for those of you who are listening. Um, I wouldn't trust chat GPT quite yet with your skincare routine. Um, but I do think it, it could be on the horizon where like there is the ability to like specifically train a language model to give decent skincare advice. Like I, I don't think it's completely out of the realm of possibilities based on what I've seen from different programs that are out there and what they've, what they're creating more and more of. Yeah, no, that's fair. I mean, all it is in, in my mind, still, all it is, is like Google 2.0. You Google, yeah. build me a sensitive skincare routine. You'll get a list type into chat BT, GBT. I need a sensitive skincare lin, uh, routine. It's going to give you a list. So I don't know how you're not more impressed by this still to this day. I just don't know how you're, <laughs> yeah, you, you know, you know why, you know that. why I, you know why I say that though is because no. I, I, I'm like, all right. I grew up back when like dial up internet and AOL first came too. out and like, um, and like literally like the internet like came out when I was a kid and like, we would have things like load, like super slow and you could like, and there was like 10 web pages at the time. And like, I mean, the fact that now that you could type in a prompt like that and it could give you like a bespoke skincare routine, like whether it's good or bad, like in accuracy, um, it is like a massive advancement over like our lifetime and like what computers are capable of doing. Like to me that like if you benchmark it against like, you know, everything else that existed last year, it's like not that impressive. But if you like think about it over like the course of our lifetime, like this type of advancement is just phenomenal to me. Mm -hmm. I mean, okay. Like if you compare it to yes, childhood to now, I agree. It's horribly and ridiculously different and wildly advanced. But uh, Google from last year to chat GBT for this year, I'm still like, eh, it's the same pony in a different like horse outfit. It, it just looks, it's, it's just diff like a little bit different. Yeah. And, and, but here's why I think though, here's why I think it's actually real. Uh, it, here's why I think I'm unimpressed and you're very impressed. You utilize this more effectively, I think, in your day-to-day -day life. I don't know how to use it. I'm still just like doing the same things I was two years ago. So for, my, for me, it's more like an outsider perspective. I'm like, this is kind of cumbersome, like AI in general. Um, it hasn't it impacted me because I'm not using it well. Um, but maybe if I, you know, take a month off, learn how to use a computer, um, live, you know, like the grandfather life for a little bit, try to catch up with things. Maybe I'll be very impressed and maybe I'll see its utility and like really appreciate it for what it is. That's fair. All right. Well, um, right now I wouldn't, I wouldn't run to chat GPT for your skincare routines, but, uh, but for those of you, um, you could try it, go in there, type in, you know, your current skincare concerns and see how close it is to your current routine. I think it'd be interesting to see. Um, so today in this episode, we went over the different hacks that we've seen online, which is a lot of hacks that we covered. Yes. Um, and whether, and we put a lot of information in each one of these, why we like them, why we don't like them. And then we talked about having chat GPT build us a skincare routine. Thank you all so much for tuning in and definitely check out remedyskin.com If you want to sign up for our wait list. Um, and if you're on Instagram, you follow us on Instagram or TikTok. definitely check out the shops on remedy, um, to take a look at the headband. So nice. I'm super excited about that. Me too. I'm so stoked. This is, um, this is in the most biased statement I will ever make. This is the best and biggest skincare launch I have ever seen. <laughs> and I'm really excited for everybody to get to experience this. So there's that. No, I truly, uh, <laughs> it's, you know, not another celebrity band is how I would frame it. I mean, it really, I mean, all of you, you know, if you've made it to this point in the video, then, you know, you're an OG with us. Um, and, uh, yeah, like I mean, you. I, I mean, I hope you see how much thought and effort I put into the products once we release them. Uh, but it really, it really encompasses everything that we've t talked about with you and discussed with you. So I think you'll see where I went with this, and it will make a lot of sense why I decided to create something. So um, thank you all so much for your trust and support, and we will see you on the next episode. We'll see you next time.